Good. So good evening to one and all. My name is Gustavo Rivera, state senator for the 33rd district in the Bronx, the Boogie Down Bronx, and uh, chair of the health committee in the Senate, welcoming you to uh, the latest in a series of uh, interactive and virtual town halls that we are doing around MRTA or the uh, Marijuana Ref uh, Reform and Taxation Act. I think it's what it's uh, more referred to referred to by some folks as MURDA. And, and although this joke will probably fly over the heads of most folks who are younger than me, it's MURDA. So I just have to do that every time that 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 uh, that that thing comes up. Uh, so a couple of things uh, quickly. Para aquellos participantes que estén hablando en español, eh, para que hablan español en este momento, vamos a aprender la interpretación en Zoom. Eh, lo vamos a hacer ahora y eso quiere decir que si usted y estamos también estamos en Facebook para que lo sepa también pero si necesita el español hágale clic a la opción abajo en español que está abajo de nosotros y vamos y si usted está en Facebook tiene que acceder a el Zoom para eh, recibir la interpretación en español porque va a estar in vivo. So switching back to English for folks that uh, if you know anyone who actually uh, might not be on right now, but still, you know, we're, we're just getting started. So you might want to get them on. And folks that are Spanish speakers, we are also doing live interpretation. The option will be available right below us. So again, thank you for joining us uh, in, uh, in what is uh, uh, the Cannabis 101 webinar. This is an introduction uh, for, for New Yorkers who are interested in the cannabis business and opportunities. As I said earlier, we passed the, uh, the MRTA, which is the Marijuana Regulation and Taxation Act just over a year ago. And the reason I voted for it, uh, I was very interested, particularly in the fact that uh, at the core of it were restorative justice measures. There was an understanding that for a long time, the criminalization of, of, of cannabis uh, had meant, even though the use of cannabis was about the same in every community, there was a there was a disparate impact on communities like the ones that I represent. So we wanted to make sure that as we transform this and we make it into a into a legal uh, and, and to use something legally, just like we do for cigarettes or alcohol, etc., but that we make sure that we try to repair some of the harms that have been caused by the drug war for so long. And that means that we wanted to pass a bill that had social justice at the core of it. And it is actually something that uh, uh, was, is, is something that uh, we're doing in ways that other states have not done. And we're kind of, we wanna make sure that we get this right specifically because we have social justice at the middle of it. Now, a cannabis also known as marijuana or pot weed or grass or chronic or Mary Jane or ganja or wacky tabacky, et cetera, et cetera, is now legal in the state of New York for adults that are over 21, but sales have not begun yet. And that is what this is about. Um, as we're going to talk about today, all the different opportunities, certainly uh, retail is one of the opportunities. There are a lot of other opportunities that exist uh, for people in this business. We wanted to make sure that we had an op uh, that we had an opportunity for you to hear from experts, folks who have worked in this field for a while. Um, as well as from the Office of Cannabis Management itself. Uh, they have made some progress on regulations, uh, guidance, and public health education, um, and they've created a series of proposed regulations. And we're going to talk about those, but you should know that these proposed regulations are going to be... Um... Oh, by the way, we should probably... You probably share the screen, uh, uh, Rachel. Yes, there you go. I forgot about that. There you go. So we have uh, a couple of things. Let's go through the let's go through the slides that were there. We kind of forgot to do this earlier, but this is Spanish interpretation is available to you. Keep going. Constituent Services, my office is always available to you for anything that you might need. 718-933-2034, as well as the uh, as well as the uh, as the email. And uh, um, we have and all the social media all the social media accounts are there. In the next one. And keep it rolling, keep it rolling, so that we can get to the, uh, so that we can get to this one right here. Now, the the regulations are 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 at right now are under consideration. So that means that you can comment on these until May thirty first of twenty twenty two. 
So if you actually, you know, we're going to leave this on the screen for a second. So you can write, if you have, if you want to look at what the regulations are, you can go to cannabis.ny.gov slash cannabis dash control dash board dash meetings. So cannabis control board meetings. If you go to that website, you can see the regulations and you can comment on those regulations up to May 31st. So we want to make sure that you have an opportunity to do that. And in Spanish, we just want to put it up there as well. So uh, you have uh, the, the period of el periodo de comentarios cierra el 31 de mayo de, 1900, de 2022. Um, me one second. We might be having some technical issues with the interpretation. If, uh, I mean, let me just hold on for a second for my staff. Were we able to get that working, folks? If not, we're going to keep it rolling, but just want to make sure. Okay, so it's going to continue to be worked on. So let's just let's just continue since we have folks on here, particularly. Um, so as far as these comments or regulations, uh, on these regulations, you can email them. You can you can go to the website and you can put all your all your comments there. Uh, I should also mention before we before we go forward a couple more things because we have a, a packed panel, but we have a couple of things up top that I want to make sure that we cover. The state budget that we passed just a little bit ago has uh, over 50 million uh, in state investment to cannabis social equity fund. Now you should know that. Thank you. Uh, I want to thank the majority leader, majority leader Andrew Stewart Cousins. She negotiated stronger provisions for this Cannibal Social Equity Fund so that we establish the rights of so-called social equity, equity licensees, uh, oversight, transparency, et cetera. There was a lot that was done in that budget and certainly the leader, the majority leader had a lot to do with it. So thank you, majority leader. Um, and uh, uh, just a couple of things before we move on to, uh, to, to our panelists. Uh, first of all, remember folks, if anybody tells you, because regarding expungements, I wanna talk about this for a second. Tonight, we will not be di uh, diving deep into this, but if you have anybody that tells you that you can pay them to get your marijuana related record expunged, they are scamming you. This is a good thing to remember during this process where new things are being established. Uh, new processes are being established. Uh, this law is going into effect. There's going to be a lot of knuckleheads out there. They're going to be trying to take advantage of you. Uh, in the case of business owners, and we're going to talk about some of the scams that might be, that might, uh, that you, you know, you should step aside from. We're going to talk about that later. But if you have a marijuana related record and you want that expunged, that happens automatically. That is not something that happens when you pay someone. So they are scamming you if they say that. Please contact our office if there's somebody that tells you that they can do that for you. Uh, and also related to licenses, this is important to understand because right now what we have are conditional cultivated licenses. Those were, are for folks who are farming, who will be farming cannabis. Uh, so that means that if you were sold some sort of cannabis business license or you pay a, a broker to file an application, make sure that the only, that you understand that the only license that is available right now for application is the conditional cultivator license. So tonight we're gonna to be particularly focusing on educating folks who are entrepreneurs, business owners on, on, the, on some of the challenges that exist uh, and some tips on business development generally, but then specifically on this field, particularly since you have, uh, since we have folks, as you will learn, who are just, uh, who have a lot of experience in this. And uh, speaking of the folks that we have joining us, uh, although there's a special, guest in a second. The first folks uh, that we are joined by by three fantastic panelists, uh, Christina Bucola, who is a, uh, a cannabis attorney and is working with the Bronx Defenders uh, to determine how to help people navigate this and stay tuned for more information on that pretty soon. We're also joined by Clarence Stanley, and he is a, a good friend, an old friend. I've known this brother for a long time, and he leads the uh, college, uh, uh, Lehman College's a small business development center. So he'll be talking about, uh, about just the challenges sometimes of just generally putting a business, a small business together. And last but certainly not least, because we want to make sure that we talk to people who have experience and who have gone through it uh, and can teach us from the, from the challenges that they had to face. We're joined all the way from California from, by Nina Parks, 
who is a cannabis business operator and a regulator who is based out in California. So we will hear from those three folks, but the special guest that we have with us tonight, uh, and if you could, and if you could turn on your camera, we will see the gentleman uh, in a second, and that is Talil Magu, who should be on the screen shortly. There's the gentleman. Now this. This fine fellow right here is the Deputy Director of Legislative Affairs at the Office of Cannabis Management here in the state of New York. And I'm very, uh, thank you so much for, for being here this evening. So I wanted to give you a chance to kind of like, you know, uh, talk a little bit about the work that you folks do, and then we will get on with the panel. And thank you so much for joining us. Please, Senor. Uh, thank you so much, Senator. Uh, you know, it's uh, great to be here. We're finally actually now getting out and meeting with people in the public. That's going to be coming down uh, the next couple of months. But we've been very, very hard at work. Um, as you know, as the senator said at the top, uh, we passed this bill back in March 31st of 2021. But we didn't get started until September and then October of 2021. Uh, I was appointed to my position October 5th. And then I started working at the office uh, in real time in December. Uh, as the Senator said, I'm part of the Office of Cannabis Management, and in that office, we have a bunch of agencies, right? We have a bunch of different teams. We've got a legal team, a licensing team, uh, an enforcement team, campaigns, research, a whole gamut of, of people that are helping put this thing together. Uh, I come from the external affairs team. So in external affairs, uh, what we do is basically what you're seeing right now. We get out to the people, we get out to the legislature, we get out to local government. We make sure that people understand what we're doing behind the scenes and we help train people and get people involved. We help people get engaged. And so that's what I'm here doing tonight for the senator and his team. And I'm happy to be here and do it. Um, and my job as legislative director, uh, I basically keep in contact with uh, the state Senate, the state assembly, uh, the governor's office, as well as the governor's team down in DC dealing with federal legislation on cannabis, right? So this whole team that I'm a part of uh, is not just me legislatively, but we also have intergovernmental affairs who deals with local government officials. Uh, we have uh, community events who plans everything that we do when we go out to the public, which will be coming down the road in May and June. We have a campaigns team, which deals with how we build things like our public health campaign or our education campaigns. Um, and then we have an operations team, which pretty much oversees everything keeps me and everybody else on our team in line and make sure that we get to where we need to go, whether we're going out to see uh, your local elected officials down in the Bronx or out in Buffalo, or if we're just having an event here in Albany, uh, we all work together to try to put this thing together. So that's basically an overview of what OCM is and what my agency does, my unit. Uh, but I can actually start and jump off by what the Senator talked about initially, which was um, public health. Uh, you know, As the chair of the health uh, committee in the Senate, we work very closely uh, with his team on how we're going to get out there and message for everybody to make sure that everyone understands uh, the health ramifications of what we're doing and why we're doing it. Uh, and so we just launched our public health campaign uh, for the very first time on the 4th of April. So just a couple of weeks ago. Uh, and the focus for this campaign is really to get people to understand that we used to deal with cannabis as a criminal justice and enforcement issue. Uh, now we're transitioning that into a public health issue to an issue where people are thinking about cannabis in a way that's centered around health and wellness, around safety, as opposed to just focusing around who should be locked in jail and for how long. Um, the things that we're focusing on in this campaign, first of all, you should know that you'll be seeing things, if you haven't already, uh, you're going to be seeing things on TV, you'll see things in social media, you'll see bus wraps and train wraps. You'll see signage at bus stops and on your on the inside of the train. Um, and we're doing things continuously. A lot of states started a public health campaign after they rolled out their program. So it was a little bit too late, right? Everybody was already kind of engaged in things. Or some states roll out a public health campaign um, and then they stop it a couple months later. So then it's like, if you missed the messaging or you forgot the messaging, too little, too late. New York State is going to make sure that we're funding our public health campaign into perpetuity forever. We're always gonna be out there reaching out to people. We're gonna be educating people constantly. We're gonna be updating, doing focus groups constantly. We're gonna make sure that we always have the latest, most up-to-date health information for everybody to understand. And we're gonna be engaging in research 
and using that research to inform how we actually reach out to people. So you should always be on the lookout for that. And we're actually going to launch the second phase of our campaign tomorrow on 420. Uh, and the things that you'll see covered here are like, you know, making sure that people Virginia. understand, <laughs> making sure that people understand uh, that it's for adults only, um, that you shouldn't drive or you get a DUI, um, that you need to store things safely uh, to keep them away from pets and children. And if they do get into something that you need to call poison control, uh, we make sure that everybody understands that you can't consume cannabis everywhere. If you can't consume cigarettes in the spot, then you shouldn't smoke cannabis in the spot either. Uh, we want to also make sure that people who are pregnant or breastfeeding are aware that there's still a lot that we don't know, that you should stay away from these things if you're in those uh, two phases of your life, to make sure that the health of your baby and yourself uh, remains at the toppest level, the most healthy you can be for you and your child. Um, now, switching gears, I want to talk about the regs process, right? So the senator talked about regs. So a lot of people are like, what are those? What does that mean? So we have the MRTA, the Marijuana Regulation and Taxation Act. That's the law. That's what is the framework for everything that my agency does. But then in terms of how we implement things and actually get things rolling, we needed to uh, get some regulations done. And the way that we do that is we draft those regulations here at OCM. And the board, the Cannabis Control Board, reads those regs over, they approve them and send those regs out to the Department of State for New York State. The Department of State takes those regs, they put them online, and then everybody gets a chance to look at them, read them, get mad at them, like them, comment on them, show them to all their friends. We want you to do that because we want everyone to be engaged. We want everybody to understand the market that we're setting up, why we're setting up the way we're setting it up. We want everybody to participate. Even if you don't like cannabis, even if you think that something uh, that we're doing is great, you should still make comments. You should still be familiar with these regulations so that you understand exactly what's happening in your state because every and single state is different. Khalil, I'm going to interrupt you for one second go, really go, quick. Go right ahead, Senator. Two quick things. Number one, we we found a solution for the folks, aquellas personas que necesitan español, sepan que le vamos a poner un número de teléfono. Hay un número de teléfono en el chat que usted puede llamarlo para tener la interpretación en español. That's number one. Number two, I see that questions are already piling up. Save them, folks. We will have a chunk of Q&A at the end. So all of these queries will be responded to. So sorry, I just wanted to get through those things. Please continue, Toledo. Not a problem, Senator. Um, and so let's get back to the Rex con uh, conversation here. So when you, when you get a chance to get online and read through these regs, uh, make sure that you are making comment. We, we want to have everybody, whether you're an individual, whether you're a group, these regs touch everything. These regs are going to touch how you get your license, how much the license will cost. Uh, they're going to touch things like when you open up a dispensary, what you're allowed to do, what you are not allowed to do. Uh, we want to make sure that everybody understands the entire system that we're going to be participating in. So make sure that you get out there and read those regs. Now, these regs, whenever they go up, they go up for about 60 days. The senator mentioned the regs that are up right now. That regulation process ends on May 31st, but that is only for the conditional regulations, not the overall program. And I'll get into the difference about that a little bit later, but right now we have the conditional cultivators uh, and we have the conditional retail dispensaries, which will be coming up uh, pretty soon. When those conditional retail uh, regulations end on May 31st, we take them back. We look them over for another two months. We take everybody's comments and the best comments, the ones that things we didn't think about or things that we need to add, we add that back in. Then we send them right back out to the public. You get another 45 days to look those regs over. So now you'll see how they were updated and amended, uh, how they become more inclusive, they've been broadened, and then you get a chance to decide whether or not you want to make comments on those as well. After that 45-day period ends, we send them back to us, we finalize them, and then they become the actual regulations. So we've done that with conditional uh, cultivators already. We're now in the process of doing that for conditional retail dispensaries. And right now I'm on a team that is writing the regs for the overall umbrella MRTA. Those regulations will be released to the public for the first time sometime in June. Uh, and then again, you'll go through the whole process. You get 60 days to look at those regs, then we'll take them back, We'll look at them, we'll add what we need to add, we'll send them back out to you guys for 45 days. That will be the process. Again, that process will start sometime in June. Last thing I wanna say is that uh, 
I want to explain the difference between the regular MRTA program and the conditional program, which we have going right now. So we were very, very much delayed at the, at the OCM. We were supposed to start our work back in April of 2021, but there were a lot of things going on and we didn't get that start until October and November of 2021. So that meant that we wouldn't get a retail dispensary up and have all the other licenses available until sometime mid next year in 2023. In order for us to cut that time down, we decided to create a conditional program. The only thing we're doing for conditional programming is cultivators and licensed dispensaries, right? When the cultivators start planting, uh, which will happen very shortly, we just issued 52 licenses and we're working on another, uh, another 50 to 100 right now. Um, those people will start to grow. That product will be ready in October, November, and hopefully these conditional retail regs will be approved. We can start giving them licenses and build their dispensaries. And then the growers from conditional will give the conditional licensees some product to sell. In the meantime, we are still writing the regulations for the overall program. I have something I'm gonna share with you guys right now. Uh, I have been working on making sure that the regs, as you see here, are gonna cover all of this. Cultivation, nursery, processors, distributors, retail dispensaries, delivery, on-site consumption, cooperatives, and micro-businesses. All of this stuff is coming later. This is the stuff you're gonna see in the regs in June, right? You're not gonna see that stuff in the regs right now because we're only doing conditional because we wanna get something to market. We wanna make sure that people have something so that they stop buying unsafe, untested, illegal cannabis and then get something that's been proven to be okay for your consumption as a New York state citizen. So when these regs come out in June, we want everybody to get on and look at those ones as well. And we also wanna make sure this is for business uh, people, entrepreneurs, people who are thinking about getting involved. Not only are these are what's gonna be available for licensing, but we have all of these as well. These are the ancillary businesses. People don't think about ancillary businesses that much because they're so concerned about like being a processor or an extractor or a retail dispensary. But all of these licenses you see here, they're not necessarily part of the MRTA or for cannabis. You can already have this license right now. You can be a retail person. You can be an accountant right now and still get involved in the cannabis ecosystem that we're developing and, and building, right? A lot of people have to learn that sometimes if you want to get involved in cannabis, you don't need to start from scratch. You can literally just take what you're doing for your career and your job and apply it to cannabis. And we're going to need these people that do these jobs right now to make sure that our entire ecosystem is, is, is efficient and functioning and has all of the holes plugged so that we don't drop off like some of the other states that we see who run into a lot of problems. So always make sure that you're looking out for the regulations, make sure that you're thinking about possibly entering the field or working with cannabis businesses in an ancillary market. And then this way you'll always make sure, you'll always be aware of what's happening and you can always make sure that you are involved if you wanna be involved. And that's it, that's all I've got for you guys right now. Of course, if you wanna reach out, um, the Senator and his team have all of my contact information. And like I said, I can work uh, through the Senator. We are going to be hitting the road uh, mm -hmm. in May and through June, actually reaching out to people face-to-face, -face, teaching you how to apply, what mm -hmm. you need for your business, how you build a business plan, all of that stuff is coming down the road. So look out for OCM uh, throughout the summer. Sir, thank you so much. One thing I'll ask you to do before you leave, because you're probably sitting at a computer right now, correct? I am. So if you could go to your website and pull up the actual link that goes to the regulations, because I haven't necessarily visited, but I know one of our guests here did visit and is having some trouble finding exactly where those regulations are. So you could take the link to that and drop it into the into the. Uh, chat, I would be very appreciative. Not a problem. I'll do that for you right now, sir. Perfect. See, I'm All treating right. like I'm treating like a staffer, but he's not <laughs> incredibly important. Thank you so much, Talil, to be part of this and kind of stay in the background there. But put that put that link on there when you are um, uh, when you are done. All right. Well, thank you so much for uh, for Talil and all the work that that these folks do. Uh, as we said, we're just this is just getting started, so we're going to have uh, uh, so we're definitely going to hear much more from them. Now, we wanted to uh, the, we're going to start by uh, uh, the the first our first guest here is uh, uh, Christina Bucola Esquire, is a cannabis attorney 
who is working with the Bronx defenders to determine how best to help people navigate the cannabis licensing process. And as I said, stay tuned for more information on that. Uh, by the way, all these folks uh, that were that are going to speak tonight, including Talil, have an incredibly impressive resume. So I'm going to leave some stuff out. But just overall, uh, Christina, Ms. Bucola is an attorney and advocate, advocate in the cannabis and hemp sector. Uh, she started, started in transactional departments uh, at White Shoe Law Firms. Uh, she was at one point the general counsel of High Times. So obviously very much knows this issue, uh, but now she focuses on assisting small businesses, social equity groups, and legacy market entrepreneurs in navigating cannabis, hemp licensing, legal matters, business concerns, et cetera. So I, I wanna give her a big welcome. Thank you, Ms. Bukola, for being here with us. And the floor is yours. Great, thank you for having me. Oh, oh yeah, I'm not muted, I usually am. Thank you for having me, Senator. It's great to be here. Um, and it's really exciting to talk to everyone about different types of licensing. Um, so for tonight's, uh, uh, presentation, I thought it would be best to start with what really and truly sets New York apart from all other different types of licenses, and that's equity under the Marijuana Regulation and Taxation Act, as you know, is MRTA. And so it requires that um, this new law and this new industry incorporate individuals from um, communities that have been disproportionately impacted by the war on drugs, um, and also create some kind of diversity among races, among ethnicities, among genders in the distribution of these licenses. <clears throat> now, constitutionally, New York can't say we have a hard stop at granting 50% of these licenses to social equity applicants, but what we can do is we can have a looming target. And that is truly something that sets New York apart. And we're starting to see from the Office of Cannabis Management and the Cannabis Control Board just how much um, they are backing equity. And I'll get to that a little bit later in uh, different types of licenses pr that particularly relate to social equity applicants. Um, so again, to qualify as a social equity applicant, you're either a member of a community that's been disproportionately impacted, you're a minority owned business, you're a women owned business, you're a service disabled veteran or a distressed farmer. Um, and now so, communities of disproportionate impact, how are those determined? Um, there are those communities that have had a history of arrests and conviction and other law enforcement procedures in certain geographical areas that may be zip or community boards, but there are def these defined areas. They might even be precincts. Um, and eventually the Cannabis Control Board will issue uh, further guidance exactly about how, around how these uh, communities will be drawn. Now to be a minority owned business, there are business enterprises that are at least 51% owned by by, uh, at least one minority group and they pass the ownership test. What's the ownership test? The ownership test is really designed and you'll see this throughout um, MRTA and its regulations so that no one is offered as essentially a puppet and then there's someone else that's actually controlling the uh, strings and the operation. Nicola, I'm sorry. Yeah. I'm sorry to interrupt. I would ask you to slow down a little bit since oh. we, have, because we have Spanish interpretation happening okay. at the same time. We want to make sure that we go a little slower. But I'm so sorry so. about that. No worries. All good. There's so much to get through. And I'm so excited to always talk about MRTA that, um, you know, I can hardly control myself. Uh, so in addition to uh, passing the ownership control test that the ownership has to be real and sustainable and continuing, um, but that the ownership is able to exercise that day-to-day -day control over the entity and independently make decisions. Um, of course, the entity has to be uh, authorized to do business in New York State. It's got to be independently owned and operated and a small business. Um, now, minority group qualification uh, would apply to U.S. citizens and permanent resident aliens who are Black persons, Hispanic persons of Mexican, Puerto Rican, Dominican, Cuban, Central and South American of either uh, Indian or Hispanic origin, regardless of race, Native American and Alaskan Native persons, um, Asian and Pacific Islander persons having origins anywhere in the Far East, Southeast Asia, or the Indian subcontinent or the Pacific Islands. Um, so you can see that the minority group qualification is pretty broad. 
Now, women-owned businesses or business enterprises that are at least 51% owned by U.S. citizens um, who are women. And again, uh, you also have to have this test of control, right? That the people who are at the front of the business, the women that are proffered as, as the individuals who are controlling the business actually have that control. Now, um, I have plenty of clients who have come to me and they have said, hey, we're going to start this process uh, through the usual processes at the state for MW, uh, DB or BD rather, uh, um, licensure. And the fact is, is that we heard from OCM and we have someone from uh, Talil can confirm this, um, that it will be actually administered in house by OCM. And that's also because this is a really long, arduous process. Um, and in fact, some people may not uh, meet the deadlines in order to qualify as a minority or women-owned business. Service disabled veterans are um, individuals who have been injured um, while, during um, action and they have some kind of rating from the VA or the DOD because they've sustained an injury in the line of duty that prevents them from doing day-to-day um, uh, -day activities. Uh, and we also have focused on distressed farmers, right? And those are New York businesses and enterprises who meet a definition under the USDA and show that they have uh, farm operations that have been um, impacted and they're operating at a loss, either through development or suburban sprawl. Or it can be a small farm operator of which we have a number in New York um, and a member of a group that's been historically underrepresented in farm uh, ownership. So there, there, would, there could very well be some overlap um, with the communities that are identified as minority communities under MRTA. Um, now, why? what are the benefits of being a social or equity applicant? So in addition for those around 50% of the licenses that are going to go towards this group, there are other kind of business services that are going to be offered. Um, and we're starting to really see, and as regulations continue to um, be made public, we'll start to see um, exactly the uh, makeup of uh, and, and, and further aspects of what those look like. So we know that there's going to be incubator programs. Where those incubator programs start, how OCM is going to identify those uh, incubator programs as saying, yes, this is an incubator program that is uh, certified by the state, grade A, um, these business coaching services, things of that nature on, you know, that is to be determined, but it's those types of services, business mentoring services, and then also the prioritization of applications. And we've seen this in this first round of the conditional adult use retail dispensary license, which I'll speak about in a moment. Ah, actually, we're, we're at that moment now. <clears throat> uh, most people have heard something at this point that New Yorkers with cannabis convictions are going to be at the first of the line to uh, receive one of the first 100 to 200 adult conditional adult use retail dispensary licenses. Um, and this is novel, right? I mean, there have been given, uh, there have been programs in the past that have certainly um, fast tracked certain types of of uh, applications, but what's super interesting about this is it will, and, and, and Tulio can talk about this uh, probably in, in greater detail, but there's this, you heard Senator Rivera speak uh, about this earlier. There's a fund, right? It is a public-private fund that consists of $50 million of uh, public money from the state and another 150 that's going to be raised in a uh, debt vehicle, right? So <clears throat> that $200,000 fund, that is going to be used as I understand it um, to help these initial 100, 200 um, uh, applicants in building out their businesses. Because as you'll hear throughout this, one of your greatest costs in developing a cannabis business is the real estate and the build out. And so there's going to be some linking of this fund to these licenses 
to open up in what I understand to be pretty premier um, locations. Uh, so that hasn't really been done before. The pairing of the money with the prioritization of the license is something that I, I mean, and, and anyone here is, is able to uh, correct me if I'm wrong, that really is what makes this unique, right? We just haven't seen that before. Now, I do want to raise to people's uh, attention that there's an aspect of this license that it has to deal with someone's um, business holdings and, and potentially what I would argue is uh, business success, right? Applicants have to be justice involved, which means they themselves uh, or they could have had a child or a parent or a dependent or been the dependent or, uh, or spouse of someone who has had uh, a cannabis conviction for something that is no longer a crime under MRTA. Um, but in addition to that, this person also has to have an interest in some business that was profitable uh, for two years. Um, there's also the possibility that the uh, certain nonprofits could apply for this. And so I have a lot of clients that come to me who have been in the legacy and they say, I want one of these <clears throat> first 100 to 200 licenses. And I say, okay, um, what do your tax returns look like? Do you have any association with an EIN? And so when you start going through the list of requirements that are necessary to secure this type of license, you're finding that not everyone can satisfy that. Um, I also think that this is by design, right? Um, and I, there's a vested interest in seeing all of these licenses succeed. And I guess the argument can be made that if um, there's been success in other businesses that puts these licenses at a greater uh, chance of success. Um, in any event, I do think that this is a truly novel approach, um, but I don't anticipate that. And in fact, I think it isn't anticipated that most legacy market participants will be able to enter the market under this conditional license. Um, and so not only that, uh, an individual has to show that they have a significant presence in New York, and that can be satisfied by an in-state residency um, requirement or having an incorporation of your business in New York. <clears throat> or uh, having another significant um, uh, relationship to New York. Um, we talked about the conditional adult use uh, license there. Um, we can talk a little bit more about, we might have some not-for-profits on the, on the line. And so um, not only is it a not-for-profit, but they have to have tax exempt status um, they serve justice, uh, uh, justice individuals, um, and they have justice indiv uh, related individuals on their board as well. And they also have had to um, exercise or be part of a social enterprise for two years. Now, I talked to a lot of tax lawyers and we're kind of scratching our head as to how a not for profit um, can also earn uh, income from something that, or an enterprise that is uh, an enterprise that is in fact um, federally Ill or illegal at the federal level. Um, and so that's yet to be seen, but I, I do trust that, that these are, this is why we have regulations, right? That we, we have the commentary period for regulations. As Talil was saying, this is really important. This is important not only to make sure that your um, concerns are, are getting uh, aired and, and, and put in front of regulatory bodies, um, but really to understand um, exactly how this is going to roll out. And so this is one where a lot of us are scratching our head and I look forward to um, uh, answers or, or further clarification on that one. Um, we've talked about the ownership of at least 10% uh, in at least um, two years of a profitable business. And this is the other, I'm not going to say tricky. This is also another um, idea that 51% of the license has to be held by some combination of justice impacted individuals. It can be held all by one individual. It can be held by several individuals, but collectively 51%, if, if these are going to be individuals and not the not-for-profit not route, um, 
they need to own collectively 51%. Now of that 51%, there has to be one person who satisfies the test of both being um, uh, justice involved and having that business test who has to own at least 30% and exercise um, control over the entity, which I'm a corporate lawyer for almost 20 years. I've ne I mean, someone having 30% control over uh, an entire entity is, is another one that leaves my head that where I scratch my head, but I get the intent, right? And the intent here is that New York is paying very, very, very close attention to all of the parties that are part of a license, right? When you go through that disclosure process, you're gonna have to not only show an org chart, you're gonna have to disclose anyone who has ever given you money. You're going to have to disclose anyone who has a financial interest in your license. And this is because we've learned from other states. One of the states in which I, I can conduct uh, no small part of my practice is Massachusetts. Now, we've learned from Massachusetts that it's not just who's on a cap table of who owns what part of your company that, um, that Im impacts the control, right? There are a lot of ways to get a control. You can have a management services agreement. You can have a lending agreement with negative controls. You can even have an IP agreement that would actually um, lead uh, some other third party under a contractual arrangement to assume the control. Um, I don't know how much time I have. And I think I could probably speak for the rest of the evening. So I can continue if someone on the senator's side wants me to address anything okay. else. I will tell you if it, if you could if you could wrap up your presentation in about two minutes. Absolutely. Only, only because we want to make sure we get to the other folks. But as you can probably see on the chat, a lot of very good questions on the side already. We will be getting to those folks. Uh, you can also drop them in. And matter of fact, it would be better for folks to drop them into the Q&A function in, the, in Zoom. That is, if you go to the bottom of your screen and start moving your cursor around, you'll see that along the bottom, the same place where you can raise your hand right next to that is a Q&A function. You can actually write the question in there so we can keep track of them in one place. That would be very useful. But go ahead, Ms. Bukola, you can finish and then I'll pass it off to Ms. Also, Stanley. you can call me Christina. That's so Christ horrible. Christina, um, I'm just saying, I want to be respectful, Madam Esquire. I just, you know, that's all I'm I saying. appreciate it, Senator. Um, so just, you know, there are a multitude of licenses uh, available under uh, MRCHA. There's a nursery license. There's a cultivator license, a processor license, a distribution license, a uh, delivery license, a testing license, a social consumption license, a retail license. I don't know if I said delivery already, but if I didn't, it's in there too. All that... They've, oh, I'm sorry, a micro business license as well, and a co-op license. Um, of those, the other two types that are of licenses that are identified in MRTA as having potentially a, a significant impact on equity are the nursery and the delivery license. And that's because um, historically those could be entrance uh, ways for uh, social equity applicants who, pay, who don't potentially have as much capital as they need. Um, to operate a different type of license. So another uh, distinction I want to draw everyone's attention to, again, speaking to New York's intent to really make sure that they have an understanding of who is at the control um, controls of the operation for the first three years that someone has issued a social equity license. If there's any kind of change, it has to run through the CCB unless it's to another equity applicant. Thank you so much for having me. I'm gonna mute now. Thank you so much, Christina. Um, obviously, Lady has a, a lot of expertise and I'm sure that you will be, there's a lot of the questions that you will be able to help us answer. But what, a couple of things I wanna, I wanna underline before we move on to Mr. Stanley. Um, is, as was said more than a few times by Christina, this is obviously, a, this is a historic attempt to do things differently. We're the first state that actually set this up in a way. So there's a lot of intent that is in the bill and we're working it out, right? Part of the process that we're undergoing that Talil discussed as far as all these regulations and these conversations that we're having, not only in this, in this uh, town hall, but conversations that we will continue to have for the next couple of weeks and months and years are about making sure that we get this right. So there's a lot of intent in there that has to do with how do we keep social justice at the core of it. 
because we know that the drug war has done nothing but harm so many of our communities. We want to make sure that as we provide economic opportunities, which is what this is now, we want to make sure that those economic opportunities are available to the right folks in the right way. And that's going to be challenging because as we've discussed, and it's been already on the chat there, there's already been, there's other states that have not been able to do it. And they, but they haven't really thought it through as much as us. I want to make sure that we get this right. I mean, New York, New York are supposed to be the most, you know, the best state. I believe that we are, but California's fine. And we have a California person later. Uh, but these challenges, we want to make sure that we, that we get through them. So next, we will be joined. Thank you so much, Christina. Stick around, certainly. Well, next, we are joined by Clarence Stanley. And as I said earlier, a lot of people have, the folks that we have tonight have long resumes and fantastic resumes. He is the regional director of the Small Business uh, Development Center at Lehman College. He has prior experiences uh, in, in, in many private entities, Citibank, Merrill Lynch, Mobile Oil, et cetera, et cetera. Has a, a long, has a lot of letters next to his name, MBA, ABA. I don't even know what some of these mean. Uh, he's also an adjunct professor at Lehman College, St. Joseph's College. Uh, and, but he is, but what, what I know him to be as is somebody who cares deeply about helping out small business owners and small and, and, and entrepreneurs particularly entrepreneurs of color that might not know all the challenges that are that that are faced. So even though this is this might not be as a, as he will make clear certainly Clarence is here and is a, is a individual capacity and as it relates to cannabis that is not something that the small business uh, uh, center at Lehman College is helping with right now the knowledge about just setting up small businesses setting up now, what are the challenges there? That is something that Stanley knows a lot about. So thank you so much for joining us, uh, uh, Mr. Stanley. The floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, I've learned, I've been here taking notes all night. I mean, this has uh, been fantastic. Uh, 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 Tahil's uh, program, I'm um, very interested in building your cannabis business. And, uh, and of course, Christina on, on the legal aspects and making a difference in the community. Uh, I did come out of banking. Uh, I'm director of the Small Business Development Center. As you know, on, on, on the congressional side, I'll have to slow down. Uh, on the um, federal side, uh, we're not able to talk about this business. However, that's about to change. And so what we do, we've, we're finding ways to work with small business owners right now, some way, shape, or form, whatever it takes. So what we're doing right now at the SBDC, our, our general program is to help, I see someone had in the chat, how do you work with startups? How do you grow businesses? How do you get businesses to the next level? Um, we work with about uh, 450 businesses per year out of the, out of the SBDC uh, at out of Lehman College. Uh, I sit on the board of BOEDC, the Bronx Overall Economic Development Corporation. Uh, I work with the Chamber of Commerce. Now I have a lot of partners that we work with throughout the state, throughout the city. Uh, so when you need things, the services that are needed to start a business, uh, the services that we offer, by the way, our services are free, we're funded by the SBA. Uh, but we're also funded by, by CUNY and by SUNY. So there's a way to navigate. If someone needs assistance, we can continue to assist you uh, working with our certified business advisors at the FPDC and uh, working with interns. We have anyone looking for interns to work with, we have interns that work, work with you. Again, they're free. And we have a, a whole host of consultants that can work with you. So what we need for success and working with you is um, putting together a detailed business plan. You want to start your business? We will work with you to put together, BT. you want to open a retail establishment. And I looked at uh, uh, Tahil's uh, presentation of all the different aspects that you can get into. Uh, so we can work with you to uh, put together your business plan, uh, work with you. Now, the biggest thing, number one thing, when you haven't talked about money, access to capital. You need to find, I came out of banking and there is some banking issues right now. You need to find a banker that you can work with. We work with all the bankers throughout the country. So we look for bankers and you also look for investors. So if you, we, what we will do is as we talk, uh, again, with my advisors, with myself, with our consultants, uh, to find that relationship with a banker, uh, uh, with, uh, with a financial institution that can help you to finance it. We can put together the business plan together, get the finance and get your business going. Um, the next key aspect is your, your, your location. How are you gonna mark marketing your business uh, your social media, your website development. But guess what? We can help you with all that. Uh, we have uh, these wonderful interns. We have consultants, but the interns can help you with the website development. You want to go to the next level, we work with the uh, chamber and uh, different programs uh, to help you 
take your marketing level to the next level. Uh, we mentioned, we talked about tax assistance. See, taxation is a big thing. To make sure your tax aspects are together. Well, we have tax professionals that will work with you. And I, I'm a tax person myself. Uh, and my staff is well key to that. Um, government contract certification. Uh, minority certification, we work with you. We work with uh, uh, different organizations. If you're looking for government the certification on the city, state, uh, and well, on the federal side. Again, we're going to separate the, the cannabis business from the federal side, but we can talk about it on the state side. We can talk about it locally. Uh, can you come to my office and talk about uh, uh, the cannabis business? No, but can we talk about business in general? Yes. Uh, a lot of things to, to talk about. Uh, there's a lot to know. Uh, it's the key to success uh, for this business is having a building your brand, the brand for your own business, building your name recognition. Uh, this is going to get into details of writing the business plan, uh, having a reliable in inventory, having a knowledgeable staff. Surround yourself with folks who know this industry, uh, know the business. There's a lot to, to learn. I'm learning as we speak. You know, I, I work with businesses. Um, uh, if I were to say what our strength is, is the capital, access to capital, putting together your programs in terms of uh, business planning uh, and uh, working with partners. And if you need interns, please connect with us. Uh, these presentations, again, there's a, lot, there's a lot to learn. I'm very interested in building the New York cannabis uh, industry uh, to Hill and looking to work with uh, uh, Christina and, and everyone. This is this is wonderful. So whatever we can do, now we are available. My, my contact information is in the site. We will find a way to work with you. And I'll say it's free. And that's and that part that part is important as we made as we made very clear. Obviously, this is an this is an organization that does fantastic work. We've been working with his office uh, over there at the Small Business uh, uh, Center for many years. Uh, but because they're federally funded, there's certainly there's certain conversations they cannot have. However, many folks on this uh, on this uh, call here might not be experienced entrepreneurs, and that is a, that is, those are questions that they can answer. Those are things that they can help you with. They can help you to think about how to approach putting a business together because there are, while there are certain challenges that are specific to cannabis, there are certain, there's a lot of challenges that are general to any business that you put together. And that is something that it's a resource that is available to you, particularly if you're in the Bronx, they are incredibly helpful. Thank you so much, Mr. Stanley, for being with us. Now, we're going to move, as I said earlier, I was talking about how there's particular, uh, you know, that we, that we are, that I'm very happy with the work that this state has done and that we're kind of an awesome state, but there's other states that do good stuff too. Uh, and, and, and honestly, there's actually sometimes states that are, that actually beat us and get there before us. But sometimes there's some things that they, that, uh, and we have people who are in those states who are probably thinking very much in the same way that we are. How do we actually take something that was happening uh, that was impacting communities in a, in, that was destroying communities. Now that is something, now that it's legal, how can we take the opportunities to actually provide economic, uh, an economic spark, particularly in those communities. And they had to do something like that in an environment where the bill that made it possible wasn't structured to do that. So that means it was probably even more challenging that it would that it's going to be for many of you. And we want to make sure that we that we recognize the OGs in that regard and that we learn from them. And that is why we are joined today by Miss Nina Parks. And as I said, these folks have fantastic resumes. So there's some stuff from Go Miss, I'm sure. But uh, Miss Parks is the co-founder of the original Equity Group, OEG, not OG, but OEG. Uh, she's also the one second real quick we have now transitioned from the oeg to the equity trade network so just want just so that people know we are now the equity trade network so the equity trade network who are still ogs but i'm just saying there's the equity trade network also the creator of the cannabis brand gift of doja and served as the first chair of the San Francisco Cannabis Oversight Committee. Uh, and since we have uh, Ms. Bucola right at the top, who was the counsel for High Times in 2018, High Times Magazine named her as one of the High Times 100 top influential people in cannabis. And she is a founding member of the Cannabis Regulator of Color Coalition, 
She's been at the front and center of many conversations on cannabis and equity. Uh, so we are very, very honored to have you all the way over from California, where it is, it is still bright outside. Well, it's still bright outside too, because it's 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 almost it's the spring-like stuff, but it's like 3 p.m. over there or something, right? How do people do it? You live in the past, you live like we're in the future. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, it all but but in all seriousness, Miss Parks, thank you so much for joining us. You have the floor. I love traveling to, to the East Coast because I feel like I'm time traveling whenever I come back and I gain hours and like it's it's like I can relive days over again. It's kind of it's kind of amazing. So thank you, thank you, Senator, for having me here and uh, for your staff for making this possible. Um, just to let folks know, also what my connection is to New York is that is actually my. Uh, my journey into cannabis advocacy here in California was because my brother was incarcerated at Rikers Island in, in New York. And so um, at the same time of like trying to roll out a business here in, in California, we're also navigating the justice or injustice system in, uh, in New York um, as well and having to um, go back and forth. My father was also um, born and raised in Queens. And so I have, I have a heart for New York um, always, you know, um, ha half New York. I tell people I'm half New York Jew. So I'm half Filipino, half New York Jew. Um, my, uh, and I, I'm here uh, in what we call um, occupied Ohlone territory, which is uh, San Francisco, California. And so shout out to all of y'all in Lenape territory so that there's the land acknowledgements that are very important to, for us to have as we work towards uh, decolonialization of our language and also the way that we work as people of color in spaces. So um, really honored again to be here to, to give you guys some of the experience that I've, I've had um, within this space as um, a striving entrepreneur as well as um, someone that participates very heavily in, um, in volunteer, being a volunteer regulator because that position on the oversight committee is not a paid position at all. It's just really important um, as we move forward to, to continue to participate because the city and the state um, only know as much as we're going to be able to give them as we're participating in the rollouts. So um, background as for myself as an entrepreneur, um, it's, it's interesting because I actually came, like I said, I came into the space when my brother was arrested. Um, I had uh, entrepreneurship experience as an artist and as a photographer. Um, I came from a nonprofit background. So I, I used to do um, uh, like uh, wraparound services or participate in providing wraparound services for youth in the community that were just as impacted. Um, so when my brother was arrested and they started talking about legalization here in California and going into an adult use space away from our medical, um, the regulations actually said that people with convictions could not own their business, which seemed really um, uh, contra like, uh, contradictory to the legalization of cannabis, right? So started participating in those conversations in Oakland, California as a delivery service operator. During that time period, you know, um, I went to, uh, I went to Oaksterdam University here in Oakland uh, because they were an institution that had access to information about how to navigate the regs and what would be, uh, cons you know, like what, how I needed to cover my blank, you know, in order to, in order to, um, you know, be compliant. So um, it's really essential that like wherever that information is coming and it's wonderful that uh, the OCM is putting into place access to information on how to be compliant and how to be able to cover yourself in, in the legal space, um, you know, like utilize that. And also with Clarence uh, Stanley over there um, in the small, like uh, in the small business department, really being able to utilize teachers because these teachers are um, invested in, in giving you information versus what we saw here in California um, in private incubators. Uh, those private incubators were, uh, you know, pretty much given that role because there was there was so much community conversation around um, who gets the first opportunity. And it's like, if you are a general applicant getting the first opportunity because you have the money, then you should take an equity applicant with you. What we didn't necessarily consider is that, you know, those general applicants didn't have any educational acumen. And so to be able to be a mentor you know, some of them fell super short and never in like and never gave 
um, equity applicants the ab ability to to have a transfer of knowledge and information of how to run a business because those you know like those individuals um, that had general applications may have felt a little resentful or they felt like they were um, they were incubating their own competition and so it wasn't it wasn't the best partnerships um, there were some that had um, better intentions but other people just wanted to get through the door so they did what they were asked but fell short of impact because they had no uh no knowledge of how to be a teacher right or how to be a mentor so for for new york really hoping that the the investment into um, more like public incubator programs will help people transition and learn the information necessary to become um, a compliant business owner because one of our one of my big barriers um, as an entrepreneur was learning the track and trace system because um, prior you know like to to running um, a cannabis business in the 215 space so 215 was our medical laws um, we didn't really keep too many records you know and that, and especially if you were in the traditional space I worked as a broker in the traditional space for many years and um, we burned our documents so learning how to keep meticulous documents um, was a new barrier <laughs> you know or you know like a it, it was a learning curve that we had to get used to and like how can we be safe in it and like learning you know like having to get these third-party applications to help us keep our records in a way that was um you know like has all the information necessary just in case one of the departments comes to audit us right uh, which is nothing that we had kept in mind before so be kind to yourselves as an entrepreneur moving into this space and learning uh, new skill sets because uh, it's not it doesn't feel natural if you're coming from a traditional space to do these these new things that we're being asked to do. Um, there's a lot of issues, you know, here in California, especially around um, access to real estate. So um, I'm part of a collective of folks. Uh, it is the Equity Trade Network, right? So is your weed Equity Trade certified? Um, we are um, basically a collection of small businesses that are committed to helping each other through the pipeline. So we have, I'm going to put this in the chat, actually. Um, we have, we're building a listserv of, peop of uh, people that are um, equity um, equity members they have different they have different um, places in the pipeline so maybe they're cultivators maybe it's a nursery maybe it's a um, you know dispensary they, or make edibles or manufacturing um, any of those you know like in any of those spaces uh, we know for us like acts not only um, access to i mean really access to network and other people to help you along is super super helpful because that's what the big guys have the big guys have access to people within their network that have resources and like a lot of us that are small businesses we're going alone we have limited we have limited access to capital um trying to be able to attain real estate um, because we had no early rollout of any money so that's what's really cool about new york is that there's going to be a rollout of financial support prior to people actually acquiring spaces um, is is a really huge help because for for us here uh, it took you know people were already like maybe a hundred you know two hundred thousand dollars in the hole already before any financial assistance came um, so we we were definitely doing the building a plane while we're flying it and there's a lot of people that dropped out lost their life savings in just trying to hold on to property as the regulatory process was going on um you know like as the rollouts were happening the regulation because and also because remember for us in california um social equity was an afterthought to the original bill so that was uh, something that was very like we fought for it um within our local jurisdictions whereas new york has it built into their state, right? So you got like, we're still working um, on developing a, a state definition for social equity here in California, right? So we, you know, again, it's like a chicken, what came first, the chicken or the egg, you know? So cart before the horse kind of situation. And we're just like constantly trading, like trading between the cart and the horse, you know what I mean? So, um, like it's a, it's really wonderful to see New York actually take uh, take some initiative in in making sure that there's money being rolled out. However, a concern because this is something that we learned here 
right, is that um, there needs to be investment in manufacturing and, and distribution pipelines for equity. Because um, some of, you know, like, especially we saw uh, larger companies be able to roll out those entities, they were the ones that had control, um, you know, over production of brands and products, right? So like, even though we have um, the, the opportunity to see dispensaries being on the front line, what brands and products and who gets to who gets to benefit from that that rollout of having products on the shelf? So, um, equity trade certification was developed to help to make sure that there there was shelf space for equity brands on dispensary shelves, um, especially because here in California we're seeing people sell shelf space. So anything from a thousand dollars to four thousand dollars a month for premium shelf space in these dispensaries where us small businesses don't necessarily have that built into our marketing budget. So, um, you know, we're, we are figuring out as community and again, as uh, collectives of small businesses, how to survive and navigate. Um, I know capitalism dictates that it's like almost every man for themselves, but weed um, and the history of weed was always uh, based in compassion and based in, in a collective model. So uh, for successes for brown and black communities, the ability for folks to network and build um, network, network together is how the small business space is going to survive and thrive. That's what I got for you guys right now. And that is, that is, and that is quite a bit, Ms. Park. That is quite a bit. Uh, I, will, I will take a second to applaud you for uh, and all the folks that you work along over there, because it's, as you said, it was it was something that many folks had in their minds, but it was not in the legislative's minds when they were, were thinking about it. And we are a little bit ahead of the curve in that regard. It's still going to be challenging. It's still going to be hard, but we have the experience of folks like yourself. Thank you so much. And now, if all the folks of Christina and Stanley could turn on their 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 screens as well, because we are going to uh, we're going to move on to uh, no, but you Nina, don't go nowhere. You too, Nina. We, oh, there you are. This you were about to see. I'm sorry, you pressing the button. You were about to press the button. Don't don't. No, don't go away because I'm sure that there's a lot of stuff that you can join that you can help us with. Matter of fact, I'm going to kick this off. Actually, Stan, Stan, this is probably something that all of you can can uh, can can chime in on. But I wanted to start with start with Mr. Stanley uh, because we're talking about the, the Let's linger on what you said earlier, particularly about the fact that this is still at the federal level a schedule one controlled substance. So obviously there are limitations about what, uh, you know, what, what you can do or you can't do. So what limitations do at, so we probably going to, there, there's probably uh, both, both uh, Christina and Nina can talk about the limitations that exist as far as working with banks, but talk just specific. I want to start with you. What are some of the limitations that you have in SD and SBDC? If you could just lay those out a little bit, what are the limitations that you have on working with some of the folks who might be here with us tonight, just so that we can, so it can be clear because I, I hopefully some of them will be walking in there, but I just want to make sure yeah, that they I, the I expectations are set correctly. Yeah, the only thing we cannot work, we cannot do um, on 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 the SPDC, SP, we can't do SBA guaranteed financing, but we can work with bankers to do conventional bank financing. I just put something in the chat right now to be very careful as the lenders that you're working with. Uh, some they could they a lot of folks that may be charging exorbitant interest rates. So talk about working around the prime rate. Also be careful of folks talking about uh, grants, grant opportunities when they ask you for services. Uh, just be mindful that there are lenders out there. Uh, we can work with you. We, can, we, we will find a way to work with you to put together your business plan programs, to put together your programs. We just can't, when we go to the banker, get that banker to work with you. We cannot do conventional, we can't do SBA guaranteed financing. Okay. okay. Gotcha. Now, the, the Christina, so I wanted to for you, for you to talk a little bit about some of the challenges that exist for banking. And then and then and then Nina, if you could talk for us about some of the challenges that you faced out there with with, you know, with the fact that there's still a difference between what we can do at the federal level and at the state level. You know, sometimes I feel like when I come on to webinars, I, I just uh, try to scare people. But the fact of the matter is that cannabis is uh, a legal status really just creates complete havoc on the industry. Um, for example, I am not a plant touching business, but I, nearly 100% of my business relates to cannabis. I have been thrown out of banks, right? I'm a lawyer. 
So then when you start talking about uh, companies and entities that actually touch the plant directly, you're in a totally different category. There are banks that will work with plant touching entities and plant touching concerns. Um, sometimes their requirements are astronomical. And part of the reason around that is because they're te they technically can bank uh, cannabis businesses. They just have to follow really, really strict procedures known as anti-money laundering procedures. And that takes time and that takes effort and that takes a lot of review. And that is where uh, the money comes from. But uh, people can't just go in and get a regular bank loan. Right. So for almost any other type of business, you might be able to go in there and get a bank loan. No, not even from the SBA. And so um, New York has a system of banks that are overseen by the uh, Department of Financial Services. Um, and of those so state chartered. So I'm sorry, state chartered banks as opposed to federally chartered banks, correct? So they're still, well, as you come to see someone like me, when I got kicked out of my bank, first place I went, right? Because in 2018, Andrew Cuomo back then said, hey, here's the directive. We don't say, we don't say, we don't say his name here. Okay. AC. Call him the departed. The perhaps. departed. So you can be the nice. Departed. Okay. The departed um, uh, issued some, some guidance saying, please consider working with cannabis businesses. But at the same time, all of those banks at some point interact with the federal system, right? And so even they were really, really hesitant to touch someone like me who isn't plant touching. Um, so all of this to say that uh, we really need, and, and the sooner we start talking about this, the better, there's going to be a banking crisis, particularly when we have to bank social equity applicants and legacy market participants who have historically been redlined out of traditional banking systems. So right. I, and I'm sure Nina can speak to this better. Which is what I was going to just, which is we, what I was just going to ask her. We see it. It's coming down the road and we need to come up with some real solutions to sweet. Which I was just, I was just gonna, I was just gonna ask. Like, so obviously, these are things that you've already dealt with and been dealing with, and have managed to figure out. Tell us a little bit about your experience. Definitely. So um, back in like 2018, I was still sitting on the on the California Growers Association board, where um, I was actually on the banking committee, where we had Jan Owens, who uh, was then the person that would was like the top cop essentially at, in, in California that would uh, enforce on the banks, right? Um, in the event that they took on cannabis businesses. And she was the one that really helped to lay out um, at least my understanding of all the different compliant pieces. And it is a lot, it's overkill. And most banks will not uh, take on that responsibility. So like, you'll just, you'll call, like I still call around to a bunch of state charter banks and they're like, we're not, we're not taking this on. Like they just, they feel like they don't have the capacity to do all the regulatory things to make sure that if they get audited, um, you know, so we're, so our, our, our choices are super limited. There's maybe like five banks that have taken it on. None of them are paying me to shout them out. So I'm not going to. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. But they should. But they should. I'm sure Ms. Park. Like dang it. <laughs> um, but you know, like their cost is like, there, it's like uh, anywhere from, um, you know, from $2,000, um, you know, like a month for compliance fees, which for small businesses, again, is like, an, it just adds up, it, it, you know, like, which makes it so, you know, our ability to pr provide affordable, um, affordable products, it gets like smaller and smaller because of how much it costs to operate, right? So um, I, like we did find, finally, we found uh, this bank who has actually committed to creating, um, you know, like uh, equity, like an equity um, uh, rate, which has been really, really nice. And they've, uh, you know, it's a uh, 250 bucks, which is like really good. But again, on our side as a business, there's a lot of compliance. Like, so we have to make sure that we're entering in all of our, um, all of our vendors and like their licensing and like when, you know, like uh, sending emails that for them to expect that there's money coming through. And it's just a lot of like over more, more coordination and admin, you know, <laughs> so the admin. Again, people that used to burn documents, this admin is crazy. <laughs> so. 
<laughs> exactly. And 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 particularly, there was a question earlier. Somebody asked about what are what are legacy what are legacy operators, right? And I, and I just think it's a very elegant way to talk about folks who had involvement with the criminal justice system because of either use or distribution of marijuana. So we're talking about folks who were who were victimized earlier in their lives and now potentially have a have a an economic opportunity so as we start we talked about this for 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 a while right there i just want to make sure that that term we might use that term that's what it refers to we want to make sure that those folks actually have these opportunities and so um and speaking about some of those opportunities and i, and I want to and i want to press this to christina because yes i agree with the whomever was i think it was roger yes all of these folks whenever they speak i learn more this is why you should just Definitely. So, Christina, talking about some of the licenses that exist right now, there is a difference, and, and, and I'm glad that, that, that Talil talked about this. So there are conditional licenses, and there will be permanent licenses. And so talk about the difference between those two. And so, like, what exactly does it mean that there, like, is one going to go away, at least in your knowledge, or one, and then one kind of takes over? Like, how exactly does that work? Right there now? is going to be a transfer period. Um, and it's, it's stated in each, although the actual mechanics of the transfer um, are certainly going to be the topic of someone's feedback, including the New York State Bar Association, just how, how does this actually work? Um, but, but just to level set, um, as Talil said, that there, there are only three types of conditional licenses at the moment. Um, there are three types, and there is one conditional license uh, application open. The conditional license that is open with an application is that is that for the conditional adult use cultivator license. Now, that's a very small group of people. In order to be eligible for that license, you already have to be in good standing with New York Department's uh, Department of Ag and Markets and have been growing hemp for two out of the last four years. So unless you have a current uh, if unless you have a current hemp license, and if you did, New York State actually sent you a letter saying, hey, you're eligible to apply for this license, you don't qualify. Um, we've also seen the regulations, not the application, but the regulations for the first 100 to 200 licenses, the conditional adult use retail dispensary licenses um, that we discussed earlier. So um, as Khalil said, those regulations, as you said, Senator, those regulations have dropped. They now go through a pretty lengthy commentary period. So you're, we're probably not going to see that license open up for at least 100 days, if not more. And 100 days, I don't even think I'm 100 days from that, that seems unlikely. So that's a little further out. Um, we also know that there is going to be a conditional adult use processor license. That application has not um, come out yet, but we know that from the statute uh, that's recently been incorporated into MRTA. And as we said a little earlier, these are regulations in which the, the proposed regulations are the ones that you have an ability to input, to provide input for. If you are, if you have been here for a while, you might need to scroll up because there's a lot of comments in the chat, but you will find that there is the exact link. This is the general link, the one that's right there, the cannabis at cannabis.ny.gov slash cannabis control board meetings with little lines in between. That is the general uh, link. If you go to the chat, if you go up in the chat quite a bit, you'll find the direct link uh, to be able to have, uh, to be able to go to the exact regulations which you can have an input on. Now let's actually, um, and, and I will go to another, since we're talking about, uh, so we're talking about cultivation, there was a question about cultivation. And that was, uh, I live in upstate New York. There was a gentleman by the name of Robert Matos. Thank you for being with us, Robert. I live in upstate New York and have three acres of land in the black dirt region of New York. I would like to become a grower. How would I be able to get into this? And I know that there's like right now there are cultivator licenses. I know that he that uh, as was said by Talil earlier, there's like 50 some odd licenses that were already issued, and there's about a hundred more that they're in the process of. As far as you know, is this going to be? Is there a limited number of these licenses? How exactly does it work? So again, those licenses are limited to only those people who are currently growing under the hemp program. So unless the, um, uh, I'm, I'm sorry, I forgot the gentleman's name, but unless he's currently growing- Robert under, Matos. Okay, Senor Matos. Um, <laughs> unless he's currently growing under the program, he's not eligible, unfortunately. Um, 
will he be eligible once you have so these are for the conditional grower licenses but okay. once the permanent program is in place he will be able to apply for licenses then i mean to, without knowing the particular particularities of his situation most likely yes and part of the reason there's a yes around that is that new york was very specific and it regards cannabis as an agricultural product so anywhere that you are able to grow a crop you should technically be able to grow cannabis now does that mean that your host or the town in which you live or you propose uh, to operate your facility is pro cannabis maybe not can they jam you up in other ways with requirements around um, zoning or um, uh, build outs, things like that? Absolutely, there can be, if you don't, you always wanna make sure you have the support of your community, um, even though, and, and I should make this, this, this distinction, um, MRTA again says, anything that happens behind closed doors, your community, I mean, as long as it's in the zoning, you don't need community sign off. It's those licenses that are forward facing that are uh, community, uh, sorry, social consumption and retail licenses that need community sign off. Regardless, it's always easier to operate a cannabis business in a locality that you know is hospitable to cannabis. Mm -hmm. And as you made the, the, as you made the distinction, I was reminded uh, once an attorney, always an attorney, certainly the particular situation you need to have, you know, she'll, she'll, she'll talk to you about your particular situation and give you legal advice, particular situation. So obviously it's important, whether it is Ms. Bukola or any other attorney that you have, those will give you specific ones. Um, staying on the farming thing for a second, this is from Janet Bocanegra. Janet, your dope sister, and I love you. I just want you to know that. Uh, how can, uh, she has like, what about a pick your own farm stand type in the rural, in a rural part of the state? And I'm, 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 I figure that that's probably going to be a no, no, but you know, what, what do you think about that? So right now I'm going to go with, as MRTA is drafted, that's a no. That doesn't mean there can't be an expansion of one of the licenses or regulations can't have build a kind of B and B aspect perhaps around our craft license, which we know as the micro business license, there's always a possibility. There's also the possibility of new licenses being created. And so, you know, I come from high, high times in addition to being a magazine that people are, know it for. Recently in the last, I would say 10 years really was an event company, right? And so I'm all about cannabis events. I love people gathering together and, 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 and consuming cannabis. I really do think it's a very healing thing. It is totally and completely different than consuming alcohol. We would have cannabis events all around the world. And you know what? There were never any fights. You try, to, you try that with alcohol and you have a brouhaha, right? So it's a totally different ballgame. All of this to say is I really want to see New York be ex more expansive with its licenses and have the kind of event licenses that I, uh, that I think would be able to be made uh, in regulation in the future. So at the moment, hard to say, probably not, maybe, maybe, okay. um, but in the future, that's, you know, that would be an incredible license. Like go pick your own cannabis. And it's like, and, and th that, and that's a good one. Uh, I remind everyone that, that again, we're talking about potentials that exist in the future for now, if I'm not mistaken, license holders are limited to one type of license. And a farm that cultivates cannabis would need a cultivator license and a retail location, like a farm stand, another Ooh. one. So there would be like, there's also, uh, there's also has to be that, right? If I'm not mistaken, there has to be like separate licenses so, for putting Yes, it but we should also make this distinction. New York was really, really, really deliberate. It wanted to chain, it wanted to divide up um, uh, the path of cannabis such that we would have the most um, entry, uh, the most participants in the program, right? And so what did it do? It said no vertical integration. Vertical integration is when you control everything from the seed down to the sale, right? And New York says, no, 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 no. We're going to allow you to stack certain licenses together, but under no circumstances, except for two that I'll get to, under no circumstances should a retail outlet be also owned by someone who's a cultivator or a processor. 
right? So that is very distinct. The exceptions to that are the existing registered organizations who are the 10, actually now nine, um, organizations that exist under our medical program and the micro license, which can control all aspects of that, right? That, those, are, those are the only two exceptions. Otherwise, there is a division of those types of licenses. Gotcha. Uh, Nina, I got one for you, which I think it that, because I'm sure, I'm sure that this challenge existed down there. This comes from, from Juan Nunez, one of the an organizer from the North, Northwest Bronx Community Code Coalition. Saludos to you, good sir. How can we ensure that companies like DoorDash, Uber, et cetera, don't take control of the delivery business? So I, I wanted to see if it, if you could give a sense of some of the challenges that, that you folks have faced in California, because I am sure that in particular, because you're in San Francisco, that's like the, the king of the tech company, like the, 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 the center of the, of the tech company. So I'm sure that somebody figured out how to just jump in there and with, with a lot of money and with a lot of, you know, capital was able to say like, I'm going to take over. Like what, what are some of the challenges that you face there and how, what do you think that we can do to keep that from happening in New York state? All right. First off, organize, 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 which if you are a part of a community-based organization, you know that's already key. Right? Yeah, by the way, Juan, Juan was very happy to hear that, I'm sure. Right, buddy? <laughs> <laughs> because, I mean, it, it, um, it is what we were able to do to, um, you know, protect our pockets. You know, like our, when I say pockets, like our, our small pockets of opportunity, right? Because, um, again, like the big guys are going to be coming in and like what what we were effectively able to do with the equity trade certification, and I have to shout out my business partner, Ramon Garcia, because he was the one that sat at the table. I was organizing um, the California Cannabis Delivery Associate um, Alliance at the time period, and we were at odds on the other side of the table of like big, uh, big delivery. And so uh, that other side of the table was ease at the time period. Um, and it's still kind of the company ease. However, because Ramon's patience and his understanding that uh, access to capital and also to, to network was not easy to come by, he was able to help uh, um, our organization, Equity Trade, uh, develop the Momentum Program for ease, which uh, the Momentum Program effectively gives $50,000 grants to 10 people a year. Um, and they um, give them training and how to uh, pitch investors and then open up their investor network for pitches as well as mentorship. Um, and it is now a continued program. They're on their third cohort. And so being able to develop programs like that with bigger, with bigger operators, we have found success in. Um, we, you know, we were coming up against bigger operators that's, you know, like that try to make it like, um, doing some investment in a social equity businesses with the charity, which is not true because we are here for business, not, you know, like not um, for like not, pro uh, not for profit endeavors, mm -hmm. right? We're all here to be able to get some sense of generational wealth development or access to more pipelines, you know, of wealth development. And um, they were able to see, we were able to actually get data that show that since we helped to curate a social equity menu, many of those people also have gone through their program. They were able to generate $10 million for their business in, like in a less than 18 month period. So it is a, tr a true investment for these bigger companies to invest in smaller equity brands and to be able to do business with us because people actually wanna purchase, you know, they wanna purchase products based on their value system and they will continue to, to do so, you know, to do so. Whereas like other companies that are just like fly by night uh, branding that are just, you know, kind of like catchy to the eye, especially in cannabis will fluctuate in price and whatever. And they'll see, they'll see um, c consumers drop off. But because um, some of these, you know, some of these businesses are very much dedicated to their value system, the community continues to support them. Gotcha. So I, I, as I want to bring this in for a landing, uh, I want to, uh, I want to again, underline the fact that just because uh, Mr. Stanley spoke a little bit less than these other two brilliant ladies right here doesn't mean that he's got that he's bringing less to the table. Matter of fact, I'd underline that particularly for those folks that have never started, who have never started a business before, who are still, who are kind of think like, I'm, I don't know, like I have an immense amount of respect for all of y'all because I've just, I don't have an entrepreneurial bone in my body. I do not understand the risks involved. I just have an immense amount of respect for folks that do the type of work that you do. And I know that, that Stanley over the years 
thousands of folks have come to them to actually make sure that they can get started and kind of how do you think about this? It's not just about having an idea, but what are some of the challenges that you need to face, whether you're doing cannabis or anything else. So I would again point you to the Small Business Center at Lehman College. And as we wrap this up, uh, I will. I, I want to thank. Uh, I want to thank Christina Bucola as well as Nina Parks. I'm sorry, Christina Bucola Esquire. Esquire, you worked your ass off for that title, my friend. I will give you that respect. I'm not sure if Nina has titles, but she's a dope sister as well. And I will say that uh, it is so. So as we talked, we talked about here for the last you know hour and a half. This is just a, this is just a little tip of the iceberg, right? This is a an incredibly challenging moment, but an incredibly uh, an incredibly exciting moment because we have an opportunity in New York state to get it right. Other states have thought about it, but we're the first ones that through the whole legislative process, and I certainly would give a lot of credit to Liz Kruger, Senator Liz Kruger on our side, and uh, Assembly Member Crystal People Stokes, who were the two, again, two dope women, who actually were able to fight and keep it as it, as it needed to be with social justice at the center of it. Now we got to make it operational. And that's what we're that's what we're going to try to do. And that's what we're going to do. And all of you that are here tonight, and all your friends who you will be sharing this information with and other folks that you will be talking to uh, in the next couple of weeks and months are going to be an incredibly important part of that, because we have created the structure, we've created the infrastructure. And we want to make sure that you are the folks out there that are creating that are that have this ideas that you take this and you make businesses. And since I'm not a big, I'm not a big wheat guy. I'm not a big wheat guy. I'm a big spirits guy. So I'll go and visit your place. I won't really buy nothing, but you know, I'll, if you got some rum, I'll, you know, I'll buy that from you. Uh, but I am hoping that each one of you has learned something this evening. Please know that uh, the, we will make presentations. Uh, if you give us, if you send us a, an email, um, uh, we will make sure to this uh, to this to this email right here, g Rivera at nysenate.gov. We can make sure that you get versions of the presentations that were given, uh, so that you have some of this information with you. Uh, and this will be recorded; it's being recorded, so it will be stored on Facebook forever and ever. Uh, and you will be able to refer it to other folks who might not have been able to be with us here this evening. Please know that we will do more of these because we know how important and essential it is that this information get out there. So one more time, thank you, Mr. Clarence Stanley, Cristina Bucola Esquire, Nina Parks, as well as Martha Restrepo, our Spanish interpreter. Muchísimas gracias, señorita. And without a doubt, my staff who made this possible, Rachel Ferrari, my deputy chief of staff, Julio R. Julio Cesar, uh, and uh, my good friend Francisco Aquino. All of these folks, an incredibly important part of making sure this happens. Folks, have a good night. Thank you for being with us.